Schreckfelder, City Clerk. You are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, April 17th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for April 17th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh. I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll move on to presentations. Our first presentation is presentation of the Iowa Park and Recreation Association Claude Allen's Community Service Award to Park and Recreation Commission member Jennifer Tickus. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Marie Ware. I'm the Leisure Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. And it is my pleasure as a member of the Iowa Parks and Recreation Association for over the last 38 years to come tonight and present this award. I'm so very pleased to represent the association and am honored to be able to give this honor to a very deserving person. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Ahrens. This is the IPRA, Iowa Parks and Recreation Association, Claude Ahrens Community Service Award. And I met him very early in my career. And he was a person who was dedicated to his community. His community uh, was Grinnell, Iowa. So it's another fellow Iowan who also was very generous on the national level as well. He started out in the playground industry and um, then sold his business over time. He has donated millions of dollars and has constructed a park in Grinnell. So if you ever have traveling youth, likely you've played at their facility. He also um, helped to build the Grinnell Athletic and Recreation Center um, within their community and has continued on through a trust over time. More than making the donations, people know that Mr. Ahrens was a wonderful person and a person who thought of others before himself, a person who believed wholeheartedly in the value of parks and recreation for people of all ages, especially children. Mr. Ahrens always lived by the expression his father would tell him, leave it better than you found it. This award, named in honor of Mr. Claude Ahrens, recognizes a person outside the parks and recreation profession who has provided and contributed to the strengthening of programs and resources within their community, area, and state. This year's recipient is our Parks and Recreation Commission member, Jennifer Tigges, and she was honored with this award several weeks ago. As a lifetime advocate for the Dubuque community, Jennifer started volunteering over 31 years ago by serving on the Cable TV Commission. She is a current Parks and Recreation Commission member who has attended I Iowa Parks and Recreation Association conferences to educate herself 
and to bring back ideas and knowledge to share with fellow commissioners. She has also been a member of the following, the Pet Friendly Community Work Group, the Pesticide Free Parks and Integrated Pest Management Work Group. She's a longtime member of and recently was elected the president of the Friends of the Minds of Spain, has been a volunteer at the EB Lions Interpretive Center, has been a board member and current treasurer of the Dubuque Camera Club, has been a volunteer and, and member of, of DBQ Fest and the Dubuque County Fine Arts Society and a volunteer at the Julian Dubuque Film Festival. And I'm sure there's more that we were not aware of. So here are just a few highlights um, from her past. In 2018, the council set a high priority goal of becoming a pet friendly community. At the time, dogs were not allowed in Dubuque parks. Jennifer was appointed by the council and tasked with performing community assessments and policy review along with the task force. Through the series of public meetings, surveys, and lots of research, Jennifer used her promotional and social media skills to further involve the community which ultimately led to an ordinance change allowing pets in most city parks and on all trails. Jennifer was an integral part of uh, the group KIDS, which is Kids in Dubuque Skate. This group consisted of youth and adult supporters who focused on building a new skate park within our community. KIDS had been working since 2005, and thanks to her tenacity, years of hard work, and leadership within the group, she, they overcame setback after setback, and the community was able to have the ribbon cutting, as many of you are aware, in August of 2019. Within the nomination, here are a few quotes from city leaders. Jennifer demonstrates extraordinary commitment to Dubuque on each of the committees, boards, and commissions she serves on. Jennifer is a major advocate for parks and recreation. Dubuque is a better place for all of her efforts. So when you look at Claude Aaron's message, to leave it better than you found it, I think we'll all agree that Jennifer truly embodies that message. So please join me in congratulating Jennifer Tigges. This isn't about me, this is about everybody who partakes in volunteers uh, for our community. And why not? We are awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, on behalf of the council, we thank you and congratulations. Um, this is very well deserved. And um, Marie's right, there's some that she missed on that list of accomplishments and things that you do because I see you everywhere. You're always out and you're always about and you're always serving and we sincerely appreciate that. And I know you say it's not about you, but it is important that you're recognized for the work that you do. So thank you very much for doing it. Thank you. All right, Adrian. Our next presentation is the COVID-19 update. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Mary Rose Corrigan, Public Health Director for the City Dubuque Health Services Department. Here with a final COVID-19 um, pandemic report and we're calling it our after action review or after action report. So I wanna begin with a look back in time since January and February of 2020. These maps depict actual cases. The blue indicates low community transmission. The red indicates high community transmission. And this is what happened over the course of three years. You can see how the rates went up and went down. And you can see there were times when the whole country was basically on fire or all red. And then there are times when various pockets sparked. We don't know why the virus moved around this way, but it did over the course of these three years. And I'd also like to remind everybody that these maps um, depict real people that got real infections and became very ill. And unfortunately, many died including 332 in our own Dubuque County. 
And so as we reflect back on what we did right and what we did wrong and what we can approve on, um, we have to remember all of those who have suffered and even died through this pandemic. So here we are today with our transmission or as of April 5th, our latest report. And looking back, let's dig in and see what happened and what we did. So back on March 20th, this is the data we had. We basically were looking at five asymptomatic people. Um, we had 39 people locally that we were monitoring because they had traveled. And um, the state totals were three positive cases, two pending, and uh, for a total of five tests back on March 20th. We quickly started seeing travel alerts from China, Iran, Japan, South Korea, everywhere. So let's look at how our after action review was conducted. Um, the incident management team contracted with a company called Emergency Preparedness Consulting to produce the COVID-19 pandemic after action report. Um, Dubuque County actually executed a contract with the consultant, which will include a separate component evaluating the city of Dubuque response operations, including public education regarding our own municipal service delivery, our safe work guidance and employee safety, and our department's continuity of operations plan. Um, currently, our city preparedness committee is still working on refining this after action report and creating an improvement plan. But the bigger county overall response um, was done by a unified approach from the incident management team. And the activities and how we attack this cannot easily be grouped into FEMA capabilities or CDC capabilities um, that are usually in public health emergency preparedness and response. And so our consultant combined these two um, capability types to report on how we did as an incident management team and Dubuque County as a whole. So we started off with the incident management team of myself, Stacy Killian, um, director of the Dubuque Visiting Nurse Association, Patrice Lambert, who at the time was the Dubuque County Health Department Director, and Tom Berger, our emergency management agency coordinator. Um, this incident management team is a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional team that can be mobilized to manage an incident safely, effectively, and efficiently, regardless of the cause, size, or complexity. We often work on very small incidents you never hear about. Um, we try to work in the command and control infrastructure to manage all the aspects of the planning and response. One thing we did notice is that we didn't um, formalize some of the reporting mechanisms as outlined in the official NIMS, National Incident Man Management System, and FEMA guidelines. Um, a couple of years into the pandemic, our county health director retired, which was planned, and she was replaced by Samantha Cloft from the Dubuque County Health Department as an interim, and most recently they named a new county health director, Allie White, who's now on our team. Um, the challenge of staff leadership um, was not simply with the incident management team. This occurred in our departments, other agencies, work sites all over the place. And so it was often difficult to manage um, new employees, new players as we moved along. So the first area we looked at was our response coordination um, and logistics. So we had um, several strengths and challenges in this area. Uh, the strengths included the information provided by the information uh, incident management team to all kinds of stakeholder groups. Um, the challenges was that at first the community did not necessarily understand the incident management team process formation and what we were. So in the future we need to do at, better at explaining that we are standing up our emergency response formally. This is the team that's going to manage it, and we're going to report to our policymakers and community partners. So we need to do that in a more formalized manner. 
so that the community and everyone understands how the incident management team will work. Um, another strength was our stakeholder briefings, which we held at least weekly to community groups, schools, healthcare providers, long-term care facilities, testing providers, um, higher education, childcare, all kinds of different groups. We operationalized um, strategic goals, and one of, one of the t um, strengths noticed was um, creating the roadmap for our response, our continuity of operations, logistics, and supplies. Um, the challenges included with all that, some of the EOC action planning that wasn't formalized on paper, perhaps. Um, policymaker involvement sometimes was scattered and um, not often understood by various policymakers. Um, and stakeholders did comment that sometimes it seemed as though the city and county governmental synchronization was off. However, I think that's a result of um, the community having to learn that we have different operations, different responsibilities, and um, uh, just different levels of who's, how we respond. So there is a learning curve for everybody there. These are some of the things that happened. We were quickly tasked with healthcare providers being overwhelmed and uh, cases rising vet rather sharply. Our hospitalizations quickly went up in the fall of 2020, and um, we quickly planned for an alternative care facility, which luckily we didn't have to use, but we had agreements in place and everything ready to go. Um, that was a result of our EMA Tom Berger and former fire chief Rick Steinis and his staff planning. The next uh, area that we focused on was our public stakeholder information management. So this is all about public information. Um, the strengths were that we regularly presented consistent information to our key stakeholders. Um, we had a challenge of how and who to inform first. And this was significant since many of the new guidance and information was on CNN before we heard it from CDC. <laughs> and so uh, the inf incident management team Someone had a rule that we had to see it from either the Iowa Department of Public Health or the Center for Disease Control official notification before we officially acted on it. And um, that was beneficial, but yet it was challenging because everybody um, wanted to know why we weren't doing something with the new information. Um, there was a lot of complex information pre presented and we tried to make it in an understandable format. This slide is from, um, this picture is from one of the Facebook videos I did trying to explain isolation and quarantine in an easy method to the public. That was, that was very challenging for a lot of people. New, new terms, um, we'd never thought about having to stay at home for a certain amount of time, and um, that was a challenge. So we thought of different ways to explain things to the public. We had the challenge of conflicting data. Um, we didn't have a consistent data system. When I first began reporting to you and the public, I relied on the governor's daily press conference statistics, which I quickly wrote down when she was um, stating them and the state staff, and, uh, and some other local statistics we had that was verified through the hospital. But that was very challenging. Eventually, the state developed the public health um, data platform called DOMO, where we had real-time access to cases, testing, deaths, um, a lot of different um, factors involved in that epidemiology. So that was very helpful, but it took a while to get up and running. And um, another challenge and success was our joint information system um, that was headed up by Randy Gale, our public information officer. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy for a few minutes, who's going to explain all the public information aspects of the response. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Mayor and, Council and staff. Uh, Randy Gale, Public Information Officer. As Mary Rose said, just a couple minutes to quickly summarize the communications and outreach that we did uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, at the onset, the City of Dubuque Public Information Office was enlisted to provide communication support to the Dubuque County Public Health Incident Management Team. Um, all PIO staff assisted in these efforts throughout the pandemic, uh, with myself serving as the official PIO for the IMT. And I'm sorry about all the acronyms, but 
you've heard, it, heard them enough and that will save time. Um, throughout the course of the pandemic, we work closely, often daily, uh, with the IMT, especially with Public Health Director Mary Rose Corrigan and the Executive Director of the Butte County Health Department, uh, discussing messaging and outreach plans, uh, us getting their approval for announcements or alerts, uh, strategizing on responses to media inquiries and more. Uh, the next few slides, I'm just gonna do a quick summary of um, our public information and outreach efforts uh, that were conducted by cities, the city's PIO staff. Uh, the Dubuque County COVID-19 updates. Uh, hard to believe, but we did 586 of those updates, updates between March 18th of 2020 and January 25th of 2023. They were daily updates for the first 13 months. Then we phased back to three days a week, uh, then weekly at the end. Um, the, the main distribution system for those was through our Notify Me, which is a module through our city website, but it meant that uh, at the peak of the pandemic, about 1,100 people were receiving those updates via email or text. Um, and all those updates were also posted to our social media channels, um, Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> I'll get to those other channels here in a second, though. And the, the graphics on the screen just show that tall image on the right that you really can't see, that's an example of one update. So each update usually had two to three graphs. Um, so I thought one, one visual I was gonna show you were, were all the graphs we created for those 586 <laughs> uh, updates, but that would've just been a blur uh, scrolling past. Um, Mary Rose mentioned the video updates. So uh, our media services staff produced 145 video updates uh, during the course of the pandemic. Those are first produced daily and broadcast live Monday through Friday for the, approximately the first three to four months of the, camp, of the pandemic. Uh, they were aired on City Channel Dubuque, streamed or posted on the city's YouTube channel and other social media channels, and links to each of those videos were included in the COVID updates as well. And so she was great about being a good sport about those, and you can tell by the example of those, the, the tone of the, of the update you know, varied on what was going on with the pandemic. There were times where it could be a little more lighthearted and, and integrate some humor, and there was times where the message was pretty serious, and, and that was just how it went. Uh, the COVID-19 web, website. You know, as soon as it began, we created a, a, a web page on the city site devoted to COVID-19, and it became citydubuque.org slash COVID-19, so it was an easy to find uh, website. It was obviously the main link you saw when you got to our, to our site. Uh, content included all those county updates and videos, local testing options, local vaccination options, FAQs, translations of key messages, community support, uh, support and resources, and links to trusted information and sources. Uh, and the content on our site, the city site, was mirrored on the county's uh, COVID-19 site. They just pulled all their content directly from that, so that there was also a county <coughs> web page dedicated to the same information. Uh, campaigns and materials. You know, over the course of the pandemic, we produced a wide variety, this is just a very small sampling, um, but a wide variety of direct mail pieces. Uh, we did a countywide code red phone call. Uh, we advertised in county print publications and on county radio stations, billboards throughout the county, uh, posters and flyers were distributed throughout the county, and of course, social media posts were, uh, we encouraged communities within the county to share, share our posts as well. Uh, Mary Rose mentioned the joint information system, and the, the definition of a joint information system is to integrate incident information and public affairs into a unified organization that provides consistent, coordinated, accurate, accessible, timely, and complete information to the public and stakeholders during incident operations. So as you can see on the list on the slide, um, it was a wide variety of uh, healthcare providers in the community, um, school districts, business uh, organizations so we could get that information out to our business community as well as a lot of employers were dealing with with issues throughout the pandemic so um, it was a kind of a sounding board uh, and whenever there was a major announcement we worked together as a virtually we didn't i don't think we never did meet in person once but it was always a virtual meeting of the joint information system um, and there was there was some challenges with that as you can look at that list each organization was part of a larger organization or system and uh, authorizations and approvals and things weren't always real smooth, but uh, it, it was a valuable thing to have. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is media relations. Um, I facilitated all media inquiries and interview requests related to COVID from local, regional, and there was even some national media uh, who contacted us asking about what was going on in Dubuque County. Uh, re requests were relayed to the IMT and then the appropriate IMT member was then assisted in preparing for that interview uh, upon their request. 
Uh, and of course, when possible, background information or answers to specific questions were provided to the reporters uh, by the PIO, because uh, uh, Mary Rose or Patrice um, uh, or, or the other county health directors were usually very extremely busy, uh, and sometimes we're getting two or three requests a day, so if there was ever an opportunity to save their time, um, you know, we, we tried to, to do that for them through those media relations and kind of uh, facilitating those. Uh, those are all I have, but Mary Rose is going to continue the presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. I don't know what I was agreeing to when I said I'd do Facebook Live for two and a half months. But, um, we did it. So, um, along with you know all the work that Randy did and his staff, we still had a lot of mixed messages and confusion. And so part of our information sharing was um, responding to those, clarifying informations, and trying to dispel myths and um, bad science and uh, get consistent information out to everyone. So the next category is about our public health countermeasures and vaccination. And this is a pretty large um, category. Um, multiple stakeholders said that they felt the information they received from the incident management team related to public health countermeasures would ex was extremely um, comprehensive. Um, in fact, one stakeholder stated that even if we wouldn't had the information, wouldn't have had the information from multiple sources, the information from the incident management team would have been all we needed to know at the time. So testing was a major focus, and it included community test site towards, um, targeted towards vulnerable populations, which we operated in May 2020 at the Grand River Center. We then moved to the Test Iowa availability, which was the um, uh, provided by Epic Health and Wellness, and eventually to mail mail-in kits, and eventually rapid testing, which you could order by mail. Um, testing throughout health care was often rationed, and as we met weekly with testing providers, we um, assessed capabilities in terms of testing and then tried to do our messaging to the public so they could meet the most uh, in important needs at that time. And then, of course, there was the vaccinations. Um, two major vaccination efforts included a drive through vaccination clinic at the Grand River Center and one at the Kennedy Mall. Um, the vaccine distribution was based on the county's allocation of vaccine and the capacity of the provider um, receiving the vaccine. The VNA managed the vaccine inventory and distributed it um, to the various vaccine providers. And then often after that initial distribution, redistributed it as people had shortages and excess. So we made it work in the county so that everybody um, had vaccine that um, was giving vaccine in order to increase the accessibility. Our other um, major site at the Dubuque Kennedy Mall was a huge success and went for several months and vaccinated a lot of, a lot of individuals. And other entities also stepped up and did their own vaccination clinics um, for the broad community, such as um, Mercy One Hospital did several in Piasta, and um, the drugstores and retailers also participated. So these mass vaccination efforts um, were challenging at first because if you all remember, we had our priority groups. And so only certain people were eligible to get vaccines at first. And uh, it was a trying time because um, everybody needed the vaccine and wanted it and we couldn't give it to everybody. Again, there was rapidly changing information with these uh, priority groups and what vaccines were approved um, that we had to explain to the public. We had legal issues, conflicting policies, and um, we also had challenges of enforcing our guidance, our public health measures, our mass mandates, our distancing, um, closures of business and restaurants, and then of course the rollout of the vaccines and vaccine supply through the national uh, operation warp speed. So a community point of distribution for vaccine providers um, the one at the Kennedy Mall was up and running February 10th, 2021. 
The location provided space for multiple vaccine providers, um, such as uh, Unity Point Finley, the VNA, several pharmacies, medical associates, and it made them easy to set up there, not clog up their normal operations at their clinic, and, and provided an easy place for the public to get to. Um, the space was provided at no cost by the Cafaro company, and the operational costs, including the cleaning setup, security supplies, and IT, um, was paid for but by the, um, the county um, Depart um, Board of Health funds. Um, a lot of, most of the setup um, was done um, by city staff, especially the um, information and IT component which was a huge lift by our information services department and Chris Coleman, so big thanks to her on that. You can see the complexity of the Operation Ward speed and how the uh, vaccines were distributed, and that's a very high level of how it was all done. I mentioned testing. Um, the Grand River site, um, did the tar we did targeted testing um, primarily to some vulnerable populations May 18th through 20th. And then the first test Iowa site was at Epic Health and Wellness in Dubuque. And you can see the lineup of cars on the photo up there in the, in the left upper photo um, showing how many people wanted to get tested. So that was a, um, a big part of the response. The, um, the challenges of testing and reporting, it created hysteria, confusion, complacency, and disruption, quite frankly. And ultimately, it came down that we eventually got rapid in-home self-test kits available through of charge through multiple media outlets. And this has um, proven to be a very good tool for the public to use in managing COVID-19. This is a picture of our um, vaccine um, pod at the Kennedy Mall. And um, as I said, those who participated were there pretty much Monday through Thursday or Friday. We did several Saturday operations also. And in terms of public policy, um, I mentioned um, the governor's proclamation first made on March 9th, 2020. That was updated 40 times. And every time we get an update, it went right to Krenna Brumwell, our city attorney, who had to decipher any of the new nuances, what was put in, what was taken out, what exactly did it mean, so we could communicate that to the responders and the public. Then you did your own City of Dubuque emergency declaration on March 16th, and that was updated six times. We also, um, at the direction of the council, created an ordinance requiring face coverings that was updated regularly as needed. We worked a lot with congregate populations and equity. Um, it didn't take me long to uh, ask the Office of Equity and Human Rights to work directly as a branch of our response team and make sure that our vulnerable populations were being reached with information and services. And um, we know that many of these were disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 vaccine, especially our Marshallese community. Um, we did Facebook Live sessions with African-American physicians and community leaders, as well as utilizing a native, native Marshallese physician to amplify our messaging directly to those populations. Community health workers from the VNA and Crescent Community Health Center also provided outreach. So in addition to the um, vulnerable populations, we addressed people in homeless shelters. Um, our housing department did inspections and brought guidance directly to those shelters. We had regular updates and meetings with long-term care and schools, who was another congregate population. And then of course, we moved on to an isolation and shelter operation. Um, this was um, the decision to open a shelter to house those who had tested positive but could not remain in their home was extremely proactive, um, but yet there were multiple logistical and operational challenges to doing so. Um, this created a system for referring individuals, transportation to and from the shelter, from both private residences and medical facilities, and providing food and other things um, to people who were housed in the shelter. 
We, we worked through shelter services such as transportation, feeding, and other tasks thanks to the work of the VNA staff, our old fire department, and others. And this is an example of an, an operation and activity that we did that went well beyond the scope of our normal emergency support function planning. It went for several months and was a rather big operation. So we, know, we learned a lot from this um, process, but I think we're better equipped to uh, do it again if we need to. I will say that our pre-existing and our partnerships paid off during this response. Since the early 2000s, the uh, city and county health departments and the VNA have uh, facilitated a preparedness healthcare coalition involving many of our healthcare partners and other partners in the community um, who serve vulnerable populations and just general community-based organizations. We leveraged these partnerships greatly. We knew we couldn't get it all. For instance, we uh, relied on the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation to have a platform for business and what businesses need to do. Um, the chamber held seminars and Q and A's um, for their members and disseminated our information. And of course, all the healthcare partners um, were involved. So here's our community transmission as of April 12th across the country, and you'll see that Iowa is a big blue blob, and that's because we're not um, taking reports of positive or negative COVID cases anymore, so they're not reporting those to the CDC. Our community level, um, which is looking at you know, the risks of um, transmission and the level of transmission occurring within the general community around the country was mostly very favorable as of the last report on April 4th. All, both of these um, metrics ebbed and flowed, highs and lows throughout the pandemic. Um, just to review what the end of the public health declaration does is in Iowa, COVID-19 mandatory reporting ended March 31st, and that's why I don't have um, up-to-date statistics for you anymore. The test to Iowa service of the mail-in um, PCR tests will continue, and those are sent to the state hygienic lab. Um, wastewater testing is available. Um, we're looking into that with our Water um, Resource and Recovery Center. Um, the DOMO public health dashboard I mentioned and COVID-19 data um, availability is discontinued, and the extended Medicaid continuous coverage ends, and this will be a process that will um, occur over the next um, year as the Iowa Department of Public Health does its wind down of that. So looking ahead, we'll be looking at Sentinel respiratory disease monitoring, and those include the things on the right there, such as influenza rates, COVID-19, things like rhinovirus, RSV, um, the incidents and trends, hospitalizations and deaths of those around the state and the country. There are several sites around the state that report um, certain cases of these, so the state has a, a way to monitor um, peaks and valleys in those diseases. Um, a big part of what we're gonna be doing and the major part of our improvement plan from this after action report is updating our response plans. And I will say that the last time our response plan, which is really thick, um, was heavily tested was in 2008, 2009 when we had the H1N1 influenza. And since that time we have new technologies, new knowledge, new capabilities, um, different ways we operate. Um, we've learned more during the last 10 years just in our general preparedness education. So we're gonna be modifying our response plan quite a bit to update it with what worked and what didn't and what's available. We'll also be, um, as we have done over the past several years, um, in addition to the uh, respiratory report the state provides is they provide a weekly epidemiology report um, to look at trends of what's happening. So, um, 
As I said, this after action report was commissioned by the Dubuque County Incident Management Team as a way to analyze what we did during the pandemic. And um, the findings and lessons we learned from this review are intended to help all the stakeholders involved in the response to move forward and to prepare us better for future public health incidences. Um, while this report is limited to addressing the actions of the Dubuque County COVID-19 Incident Management Team, um, I would be remiss to not acknowledge and express appreciation for all the facilities, services, agencies, organizations, first responders, volunteers, the Telegraph Herald and our local media outlets, city and county staff, especially my own health department staff and others that ensured the safety and well-being of the citizens of Dubuque and Dubuque County during this response. It's their dedication and selfless commitment to their duties that creates and sustained the response. And although we've all experienced uh, some bruises along the way, including you, the city council, um, you especially responded appropriately and responsibly, and you allowed the incident management team and staff to do our work professionally and to the best of our ability. So I couldn't have done it without the support of you, the city council, and city manager Mike Van Milligan, and my fellow city staff. So on behalf of the members of the Dubuque County COVID-19 incident management team, I want to thank you for your ongoing efforts and support. And I'd be Thank happy you. to answer any questions you have from three years of work. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something about how we've asked quite a few of them already, but thank you very much, Mary Rose and, and Randy, for that presentation. Questions or discussion? It doesn't mean we can't ask questions or, I mean, <laughs> we're allowed. Yeah. Ms. Wethel, go ahead. I just want to say thank you. So for somebody who was not sitting up here or sitting behind a screen via um, Zoom uh, and collaborative meetings online for city council making tough decisions, um, I was taking care of patients. And to have faith that there was a collaborative community making really sound decisions with the best information they had was brought me a lot of peace, and knowing that I had people in my whole community working as a team. So um, kudos to you, to all of the city council and staff, and all of our city staff who really helped coordinate that so that we could do our job, too. Thank you. Yeah. Here's yourself. I'd like to give you both a hand and all of your team for keeping us all safe and informed and we couldn't have made it through without you. So thank you. Mr. Well, I have a list, list of about 15 questions here, but I'll, I'll let Mike go ahead and go. I'm yeah, kidding. Thank you. So having a bird's eye view of this whole last three years, um, I know that the work of Mary Rose Corrigan and Randy Gale and Crenna Brumwell and the leadership of the mayor and city council saved people's lives. It made a big difference. And it, it, was, it was tremendous to watch. And it was, a great, it was a great experience from the fact that our reaction being the city of Dubuque and our community's reaction to this pandemic was to all pitch in and work together and make sure as few people suffered as little as we, they possibly could. Thank you, Mike. Ms. Farber. Yeah, and I also want to just um, kudos uh, to all the organizations that did uh, help us through this pandemic. But I just, from a hospital perspective, and I serve on one of the local boards here, it was just um, unbelievable the daily calls and the information sharing from the IMT uh, that really gave them some guidance and helped them with even um, all of their supplies. And that was a significant issue, as you know. Uh, and just the flow through of the people, the VNA um, especially, uh, just wanted to thank you for that extended outreach. And it was, it does take a village and uh, was greatly appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Well, it's interesting when you look backwards sometimes, isn't it? I mean, just to see all the things I and mean, remember those those days of those 500 plus different videos that you did together and all the ways that we we waited, um, you know, every Wednesday for those updates. I mean, all the things that we were all the, the ways that the entire community responded. I, I mean, it really was it really was pretty incredible. And a lot of it was doing it in a way that um, we we're doing our best with the information that we had. 
Um, and then we got better and better as time went by. And, and it was really because of the efforts of you, Mary Rose, and the team that you've been surrounded with this entire time. And, and Randy, the, the team that you put together to put the information out there for everybody. I mean, you were clearly the point for all of this. And it was, it was, a, it was a huge accomplishment. So thank you for that. Um, I think it's important that we've had this opportunity to, to take a look at what we did, the challenges, the ways we could improve. Um, you'd love to say that we're never going to have another public emergency like this ever again, but I think we all know better uh, that we need to be ready when something like this happens. So I, I sincerely appreciate that you've taken this hard look at this and worked with the, our, our partners in the county and all throughout the community to be able to figure out how we can make those improvements, look back on, celebrate the things that we did well. Um, but it is... Uh, it's challenging to go back through the memories and think about what this was like. It was, it was a hard time. It was a really hard time for the entire community. And uh, there were a lot of successes along the way, and I'm, I'm glad that we're able to sit here today and think about how we can do even better next time around. So thank you very much for this presentation. Um, we hope to not see you again for a while. Uh, we re really appreciated all your time with us, but uh, thank you very much, Mary Rose. You're welcome. Thank you. OK, Adrian. We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is Arbor Day. Okay, I believe we have Tom Kramer and maybe a few other people here with us today for Arbor Day. So Tom, feel free to say a few words and I can read the proclamation when you're all done. Okay. My name is Tom Kramer, and I am the Vice President of Dubuque Trees Forever. With me tonight are other board members, Steve Pregler, Cheryl Sheldon is our treasurer, and Laura Roussel is our president. Dubuque Trees Forever is a volunteer organization that was founded in 2017. Our mission is to plant and care for trees. We also provide education on how to plant and care for trees along with the benefits of trees and why trees are so important. We work mostly with the City of Dubuque forestry activity, replanting the urban forest of Dubuque, which was reduced largely due to the Emerald Ash Borer. This past week, the Iowa Urban Tree Council awarded the City of Dubuque as a Tree City USA designation. Trees Forever plays a big role in this award as many trees are planted each year within the city by our many volunteers. We have many volunteers of all ages, which include organizations from churches, businesses, schools, scout groups, friend groups, and many other individuals. At this time, we would like to invite citizens to join us on Arbor Day, Saturday, April 29th, at Washington Park. Our program will be from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. We plan on planting three trees in Washington Park. Our activities include a planting demonstration, a coloring contest, and other activities. Our president of Trees Forever, Laura Russell, promised us that the weather will be good. <laughs> We hope to see many people on Arbor Day. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I thought for sure you were going to say she promised you that the entire city council was going to be there because that's kind of the way Laura rolls most of the time. But thank you very oh, much. We're just suing you all. Yeah, I, that's just an assumption. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for all the work that you do with the Butte Trees Forever. It really is important, especially when we have something like we've experienced now at the Emerald Ash Borer, the ability to uh, replenish that, that canopy here in town is really important. So the work that you do, we, we, we literally could not do it without you. So thank you very much. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life-giving oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. 
And whereas trees, where, trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. And whereas Dubuque Trees Forever is planning an Arbor Day celebration on Saturday, April 29th at 10 a.m. in Washington Park and invites all residents to attend to learn more about planting and caring for trees through tree planting demonstrations, educational booths, and fun activities for kids. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 28th day of April, 2023, as Arbor Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge residents to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. All right, thank you all. All right, Adrian. Our next proclamation is No Mo May. Okay, and I believe we have Jane Agee, right? Yes, I got it right. Jane Agee is here today. And again with a few friends. <laughs> and my name is Jennifer Agee. I'm going to introduce Jane. Uh, Mayor Kavanaugh and the entire City Council, thank you so much for your support of No Mo May. I'd also like to quickly recognize Ken Bichelle, whose vision and leadership brought our group together and here today. We'd like to thank Gina Bell, Ben Podhoff, Katie Wethel, Rick Jones for getting involved and helping us navigate. Our many volunteers who have been meeting for months to organize this grassroots effort, our fearless group of students from Loris College who are supporting us and practicing their PR skills at the same time, and special thanks to Sustainable Dubuque, which provided the grant that made it possible to print the signs that you'll soon see all over our city. No Mo May is a simple concept and a simple step that lets us do more for our pollinators by doing less. Just don't mow for a few weeks. We know that native plants and flowers are best, but for those of us with dandelions, clover, violets, we can help feed the bees while they're getting established in the spring. There are hundreds of species of native bees here in Iowa. In addition to the rusty patched bumblebee, which is federally endangered and hard to find in most places, but we have found them here in Dubuque. There are many reasons to conserve our wildlife. Because fireflies are beautiful, because bumblebees are required to pollinate our tomatoes, because songbirds need lots and lots of caterpillars to feed their babies. If we let a little wildness flower around us, we'll be rewarded with more life. Thanks again so much. We're doing all this for the future generations, so we've asked Jane here to accept the proclamation on our behalf. Jane, would you like to say a few words? I really like monarch butterflies, but they're endangered. And I'm hoping by accepting this proclamation, it will make it will help support the pollinators. Well, Jane, thank you very much for being here and for accepting this proclamation. And Jennifer and everyone who has made this uh, possible this year, thank you for your work. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for pushing for this. Uh, this is the first for the city of Dubuque, so we're going to give it a shot, see how this goes. Um, I have a pretty good feeling it's going to go pretty well because I'm seeing some pretty good participation already. So thank you very much. And, of course, go Dewhawks. So <laughs> with that, city of Dubuque proclamation. Whereas insects, especially bees, serve a significant and critical role as pollinators of plants, including agricultural plants, and whereas the ideal pollinator-friendly habitat is one comprised of mostly native wildflowers, grasses, vines, shrubs, and trees blooming in succession throughout the growing season, and whereas the formative period for establishment of pollinator and other insect species and the many urban wildlife species that depend upon them occurs in late spring and early summer as they emerge from dormancy and require flowering plants as crucial foraging habitat. And whereas multiple sightings of the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee have been confirmed in our city and county, and this species is particularly reliant on early spring sources of pollen and nectar. And whereas No Mo May is a community science initiative that encourages property owners to limit lawn mowing practices during the month of May to provide early season foraging resources for pollinators that emerge in the spring, especially in urban landscapes when few floral resources are available. And whereas the city of Dubuque encourages interested residents to increase pollinator friendly habitat by encouraging pollinator friendly lawn care practices on their own properties for the month of May during this formative period. 
and whereas the city of Dubuque's policies, policy allows lawns to be maintained at a height of up to eight inches, which supports common flowering plants in lawns like clover and dandelions, thereby increasing pollinator habitat. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, mayor of the city of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the city council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2023 as No Mo May to promote and educate the community about the critical period of pollinator emergence, generation of crucial pollinator supporting habitat, and early spring foraging opportunities. Be it further proclaimed that the city of Dubuque encourages residents to voluntarily participate in Nomo May, allowing pollinator species to emerge and early flowering gra grasses and forbs to establish. Thank you all. Our final proclamation is Building Safety Month. All right. My good friend Tom Townsend is here to accept this proclamation this evening. <laughs> all right, yes, uh, I'm Tom Townsend. I'm here on behalf of the Building Code Advisory and Appeals Board uh, as the chairman of the board. Uh, to accept this proclamation. Uh, thank you to the mayor and city council for your unwavering commitment to building safety in Dubuque. Your efforts in establishing and enforcing building codes have played a crucial role in ensuring that the construction, renovation, and maintenance of buildings in our city are carried out with the highest level of quality and safety. The implementation of these codes, although sometimes not popular, <laughs> are only safeguards uh, for lives and the well-being of residents, but also protects the structural integrity of buildings. By adhering to these codes, we are better able to mitigate the risk and accidents, reduce the damage caused by natural disasters, and prevent costly repairs. Furthermore, your dedication to building safety sets an excellent example to other cities and municipalities to follow. It shows that safety of the community is a top priority and effective measures can be put into place to ensure the buildings are constructed and renovated in a safe and secure manner. Once again, thank you for your continued commitment to building safety, which has significantly contributed to making Dubuque a safer and more desirable place to live, work, and visit. Thanks again. Thank you, Tom. And thank you very much for your service on this, too, uh, especially on the board and with the rest of your board members and, um, and the many other endeavors that you serve on. So thank you very much. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the City of Dubuque is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and essential role our homes, buildings, and infrastructure play, both in everyday life and when disasters strike. And whereas our confidence in the resilience of these buildings is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, including housing and building inspectors, fire marshals, architects, engineers, builders, electricians, plumbers, and others in the construction industry, who work year-round to ensure the safe design, construction, and occupation of buildings. And whereas these guardians are dedicated to continually expanding their knowledge to provide guidance and implementation of quality codes to protect us in the buildings where we live, learn, work, and play. And whereas the, these modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from hazards such as building deterioration and decay, snowstorms, tornadoes, wind damage, fires, and floods. And whereas Building Safety Month reminds the public about the critical role of our community's largely unknown protectors of public safety, our local inspectors and code officials, who assure us of safe, sustainable, and affordable buildings that are essential to our pros prosperity. And whereas It Starts With You, the theme of Building <coughs> Safety Month 2023, encourages us all to raise awareness about building safety on a personal, local, and global scale. And whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, People all over the world are asked to consider the commitment to improve building safety, resilience, and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge that the essential service provided to all of us by local building, engineering, planning, and fire departments in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2023 as Building Safety Month in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. All right, Adrian. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, 
please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the <coughs> consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through five of the agenda. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone here in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for separate discussion? I see no one here. Do we have anyone virtually? No one virtually. Okay. Um, Mike. And then, Mr. Mayor, um, I would like to remove item number three, sustainable Dubuque grant recommendations. Only I, I don't want to remove it for separate discussion. I'd like to remove it from the agenda, and we'll bring it back uh, probably at the next meeting. Okay. All right. Do we need a formal motion for that, Crown, or are we good to just remove? Um, consensus is fine. Okay. We have general consensus then to remove that item for discussion this evening. Okay. Thank you. So removed. Anyone else virtually? I heard nothing. Correct. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number three. Second by Farber. Okay, motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing. There is one resolution setting a public hearing on the proposed First Amendment to Development Agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Seipel Warehouse LLC, providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the Development Agreement for May 1st, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolution, and set the public hearing for May 1st. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have appointments for the Equity and Human Rights Commission and the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission. All right. So um, we have multiple applicants for the first group here, the Equity and Human Rights Commission. So the first thing I want to make sure I say is thank you very much to everyone who has applied for this. Um, th this is, it, it's really important that we make sure that our uh, boards and commissions are as full as they can possibly be so that we can, um, first of all, achieve a quorum, but then also be able to get the important work done that needs to be done. So the fact that so many people have stepped up to volunteer for this, uh, sincerely appreciate it. We can only choose four of these folks that have, that have stepped up tonight. So if you have applied and you not get chosen this evening or appointed to this board, um, do please stay involved. I think it's important that um, we, we continue to, to show that desire to serve and uh, be able to find some other ways to do that um, because we do only have um, only a few positions here. So we have three three-year terms through January 1st, 2026. And then we have one three-year term through January 1st, 2024. So as we usually do, what we'll, what we'll do here is we'll take each of these terms separately. And then we're going to have, um, we're going to go around, have Adrian go around, and we will call out the name of the, the person that we'd like to appoint for each position. And then it's going to take a little while, so we'll have to just keep going through it. If there's um, not a majority of people who want to choose um, someone, as, as we've gone through all seven of us, then we can go back to the two who received the most votes from the seven of us and then and, and re-vote at that point. Makes sense to everybody? Ms. Farber. I have a question for Krenna. Could you please explain? explain to us what the gender parity uh, is on this commission. Yes, thank you. So gender balance is a mechanism in the Iowa Code that applies to boards or commissions required by state law. So the Equity and Human Rights Commission is subject to the state code on gender balance. Um, what that means um, is that there's not a mandate that you require a particular gender. Um, the gender balance statute requires a good faith effort to achieve additional applicants, um, qualified applicants, things of that nature. Uh, appointments should be based on qualifications along with gender, not just gender. So for example, if there are two equally qualified applicants and you need, uh, there's balance in a disparity one way or the other, um, for like gender balance purposes, my recommendation would be that you appoint in a way that does a better job of balancing. Um, but again, that's all things being equal and gender being the difference. What you are um, 
to be looking for is the most qualified applicant um, as part of this process. Okay. Good question. Thank you, Ms. Farmer. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Krenna. Okay. We good then? So let's go with the first term. Um, so the, the, we're going to start with the, the three three year terms that are through 2026. So we have the, the first term through 2026. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Uh, Pamela Birch. Jake. Oh, just we're just doing one okay, at a time. Okay, yep. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spring. Jones. Jake Kersick. Roussel. Jake Kersick. Resnick. Jake Kerchick. Barber. Jake Kerchick. Kavanaugh. Jake Kerchick. Wetzel. Jake Kersick. So in that round, Jake Kerchick is appointed to one of the terms through 2026. So we will start with another one of the terms through <clears throat> January of 2026. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Uh, Lauren Link. Jones. Enoch Sanchez. Roussel. Enoch Sanchez. Resnick. Enoch Sanchez. Farber. Enoch Sanchez. Kavanaugh. Enoch Sanchez. Wethel. Enoch Sanchez. Enoch Sanchez is appointed to the second term through 2026. All right, and the third term through 2026. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Matt Zanger. Jones. Teresa Sampson Brown. Roussel. Matt Zanger. Resnick. Matt Zanger. Farber. Matt Zanger. Kavanaugh. Matt Zanger. Wethel. Lauren Link. Okay, so Matt Zanger is appointed to that term through 1126. Um, then we will move on then to the final term for this uh, Equity and Human Rights Commission, which is one three year term uh, through 2024. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Lauren Link. Jones. Michaela Freiberger. Roussel. Michaela Freiberger. Resnick. Kristen Leffler. Farber. Lauren Link. Kavanaugh. Lauren Link. Wethel. Lauren Link. So Lauren Link is appointed to the term through 2024. Okay. Good job, everybody. Made it through that. I wasn't so sure about that one. It was tough. All right. Uh, Park and Recreation Advisory Commission is our next. Um, so we do have uh, one three-year term through June 30th, 2025. And here we have three applicants. So I'm going to ask for the same. Uh, we're going to go through and do a roll call in the same way. So if we could each just choose one of the applicants for the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission, please. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Jason Hinkle. Jones. Jason Hinkle. Roussel. Jason Hinkle. Resnick. Jason Hinkle. Farber. Eric Hilbun. Kavanaugh. Jason Hinkle. Wethel. Jason Hinkle. So Jason Hinkle is appointed to the opening on the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission. Okay. Thank you. We move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is voluntary annexation request. John and Diane Brem, property owners, and Seipel Warehouse, LLC, applicant and future property owner. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. A motion by Resnick and a second by Sprank. Um, Wally, am I coming to you or are we going straight to you, Mike? Okay, Mike. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. John and Diane Brem, property owners, and Seipel Warehouse, LLC, the applicant and future owner, have submitted a request to the city for voluntary annexation of approximately 2.8 acres of property. The annexation territory is comprised of agricultural land east of Cottingham Road and west of Dubuque Industrial Center South. The 2.8 acre annexation territory provides a portion of the area 
for the construction of an industrial warehouse by Sipo Warehouse LLC to be leased to Simmons Pet Food. By Iowa Code, the annexation will be subject to final approval of the State of Iowa's City Development Board because the property is considered to be in an urbanized area since it is within two miles of the City of Asbury. Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemont is recommending City Council adopt a resolution approving an application for voluntary an annexation of the territory to the City of Dubuque. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request, Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider approving an application for voluntary annexation of territory to the City of Dubuque. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? I see no one. Do we have anyone virtually? No one virtually. Okay, am I coming to you for all virtual tonight? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, back to the table then for any discussion. Right. Seeing none, motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is request to rezone Brem Acres. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Now, Wally, please, the beginning of your very busy evening. <laughs> yes, public hearings galore, right? Yes, that's right. We like to see that, though, that it's a progress in the city, so. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members, Wally Wernemont, Planning Services Manager. Um, so just coincidentally, you just approved an annexation request from um, John and Diane Bram, in addition to um, Warehouse, uh, Cypo Warehouse LLC. Um, that piece of property is being requested to be annexed into the city, and as part of that, um, in conjunction with that, they're looking at rezoning it from um, the county zoning of um, agriculture to a PI planned unit residential district um, designation. Um, that additional acreage, as indicated um, by the, the manager in his memo and in our staff reports, is to uh, in, order, in order to accommodate uh, an additional warehouse that's being constructed on the site um, for Simmons Pet Food. It'll be owned by Sipo Warehouse LLC and leased to, to Simmons. Um, as part of that rezoning request, we're looking at expanding the Dubuque Industrial Center South plan unit development in order to encompass that property. Um, the land is needed for additional grading and a portion of the parking lot and traffic circulation on that site for that. Um, the City of Dubuque Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing on April 5th um, to rezone the properties. Um, and at that meeting, Sean Hilbert of Grown Development spoke on behalf of the project. He provided background regarding the Simmons development, the Flex Steel building in 2021, and all the investment that was involved with that. And he also explained additional investment with this new warehouse, which is proposed to be about 250,000 square feet on the subject property, including this property that's being proposed to annex and rezone. At that meeting, staff um, reviewed the staff report, noting the location of the subject property, the annexation request. Um, in addition, we went into descriptions with regards to the development review team. Uh, site plan has been submitted for the proposed project that's currently being reviewed. Um, the transfer of ownership of that piece of property actually has been purchased by Sipo Warehouse LLC already. Uh, it was platted off, um, and they have made that purchase for that. So um, the Zoning Advisory Commission discussed the request, and by a vote of 7 to 0, um, they recommend the City Council approve the request. And a simple majority vote is what is needed for the City Council to approve this request. That's all I have, unless you guys have any additional questions. All right. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider a request from John and Diane Brem to rezone Brem Acres from AG Agricultural to planned unit development with a PI plan industrial zoning designation to construct a 250,000 square foot warehouse on the subject property. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, anyone virtually? No one virtually. Thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Seeing none. The motion is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Farber. A motion by Roussel, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. 
Public hearing number three is request to rezone 1061 Cedar Crossroad. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which this to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Wally, please. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wernema, Planning Services Manager. Um, the request before you is to rezone the property from commercial service and wholesale district to C3 General Commercial. This is located at 1061 Cedar Cross Road. Um, the property is actually one of three lots that were, were uh, developed and regraded along Cedar Cross Road. Um, the applicant is proposing to purchase one of those lots and they would like to rezone the property from commercial service to C3 General Commercial. During the public hearing, they noted that they're looking at quite possibly a proposal for a coffee shop or a car wash in a commercial service district that's not permitted and a C3 district that would allow that type of use. There is an existing C3 district located directly across the street, which is the Casey's, um, or which is the actual, the, the, the bingo hall, uh, to be blind society. So this will be an expansion of an existing C3 district. On uh, April 5th, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing with regards to the request. And at that public hearing, um, Jennifer Clemens Conlin spoke on behalf of the applicant, stating the applicant is the, fu the potential future owner and the sales contingent upon the property being rezoned. Um, the applicant is expecting, like I mentioned before, a car wash or a coffee shop to be located on that site. Um, they went into additional discussions with regards to not an increase in, um, in traffic, um, not substantial increase in traffic with, involved with the property. Um, when we platted this property, it actually has a shared access that the engineering department has reviewed to make sure it lines up with the existing accesses on the point in order to help alleviate traffic uh, flow through the Cedar Cross Road area. Um, staff reviewed the staff report and on the applicant was seeking to rezone the property. And currently in the commercial service zoning district, um, there are 38 permitted uses and by rezoning to C3, it allows a lot more retail sales and service types of uses. Um, which would expand to 56 or 57 type uses. Um, as I noted, there is shared access to the site. Um, the area has been graded uh, currently, and you did receive in your packet two letter, uh, an email from two adjacent property owners located in the county that are proposed rezoning. They had concerns with drainage problems coming off the site. Um, as we go through the site plan review process and uh, for the development of the property, we would take it through the development review team in order to look out um, stormwater control, the tension on site, and help to manage some of that area. The site was agriculture. It's always kind of been agriculture zoned in, and it's been filled on over the years. Um, and it is, there is quite a topography change from the rear of the property down to those subject properties, which um, actually take their access off of North Cascade Road at the back. So um, the Zoning Advisory Commission, um, Reviewed the request, and by a vote of 7 to 0, they recommend the City Council approve the rezoning, and a simple majority vote is needed for the City Council to approve the request. That's all I have, unless you guys have questions. All right. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider a request from Nemers Cedar Ridge Farm Limited Partnership to rezone property at 16, or I'm sorry, 1061 Cedar Cross Road from CS Commercial Service and wholesale to C3 General Commercial, and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have any public comment on this? I'm Jennifer Clemens Conlon from Clemens Walters Conlon Runny and Hyatt LLP at 2080 South Park Court, Dubuque, Iowa. I'm here with Mr. Ertel. Mr. Ertel asked me to share some information with you, but you pretty much have all the information that I was going to impart to you. Mr. Ertel is available to answer any questions should you have any, and I'd certainly be happy to assist if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public input on this item? Okay, seeing none, do we have any virtual input? No one virtually. Okay, back to the table then for any questions or discussion. Wally, I do have a question actually for you. The, um, so, you know, I, I notice a trend when we talk about rezoning a lot of the time, mm -hmm. we get these um, concerns about drainage, water runoff, things like that. Um, you mentioned yourself, the topography changes here. You know, this area is definitely one where we see tons of hills, um, a, lot of, a lot of changes from, you know, cement to, uh, Platted property then to uh, you know some sort of a forest or something like that. How do we address the the water runoff issues as you go through the planning process um, when it comes back before you? I just if you could outline that just a little bit more, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. So um, in our development review team, the engineering department has a stormwater review engineer, um, and as part of that stormwater review, we require stormwater calculations. 
We require how the site is going to be developed, where is the stormwater being directed to, how is that being contained on the site. Um, as sites are developed, there is additional impervious area. So where they're required to control the flow and the rate that comes off the site, in some cases detention and infiltration. We do try to encourage infiltration as much as possible of the site. We do require two tools of stormwater management, which could be multiple things in order to encourage some of that infiltration into the ground. But uh, they will review those stormwater calculations um, and we have what we call an MS4 permit through the, the nationwide permit that our engineering department gets involved with. So there is some responsibility that we get involved to ensure that the stormwater is being managed on the site. We also handle the complaints. So if there is a complaint in regards to stormwater runoff the site, our engineering department will investigate the review it through the uh, development process. As part of the development, we require what we call a SWIP, a stormwater pollution prevention plan. And there's an erosion and settlement control permit that they have to apply for. So there are several layers of review that gets involved with the stormwater management. Um, a lot of times with some of these undeveloped vacant sites, that's what they just are. They're, there's no stormwater control on them currently. So when there's a heavy rainfall, they may just run off. Um, if you think of uh, you know, an area that's mowed versus um, an ability to capture and infiltrate some of that property. But then also with the site plans, we have the ability to control that rate and where it's going through a curb and gutter system. Um, so several of those things. So there is quite a few things that we get involved with. Most of the time when it happens, the, the stormwater is actually improved. And then also we do have the ability to listen to the adjoining property owners and say, hey, if there's already a known um, erosion or uh, control issue, that's something that we, they definitely take in an advisement because we don't want to exacerbate an existing stormwater issue on the adjoining properties. So. It's very helpful. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to say a little bit more about that because I know it's a concern we hear fairly often. So thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Then the motion is to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. And a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number four is request to rezone 900 Alta Vista Street. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second. And a motion by Roussel, a second by Jones. Wally, please. Yes, uh, Wally, we're my planning services manager in case you forgot me about the pre <laughs> previous two cases. <laughs> the so, recording does restart, so thanks for saying it over right, again. That's right, that's right. So I think uh, some people are probably familiar with the site. This, the subject property is a single piece of property that has historically been used as the sister of the visitation property um, by Loris College. And I mean, and later as part of Loris College as classrooms, dorm rooms, and a parking lot actually, I believe it housed the mu music department um, for that site. Um, and in 2016, uh, one of the dormitory structures on the site was struck by lightning. Um, started on fire and that, that portion has been deconstructed. So there's a large portion of the site is actually green space with the removal of that building. Um, the property is generally bordered by mixed uh, residential uses to the northeast and south of the property. Uh, and there is a commercial corridor, on, on, corridor along University Avenue. And then also we have the Alternative Learning Center campus directly to the north. We have Nativity Church uh, across the street for the, for the site. Um, when we look at our comprehensive plan, we look at um, you know, how does approval of rezoning relate some of those goals. And, and with regards to this rezoning of the property from ID institutional district to OR office residential, you know, it helps promote a mix of housing and mixed use development. Um, the goals also recommend multifamily development and proximity to jobs min to minimize transportation costs. The proposed rezoning will create an opportunity for a mix of office and residential uses within proximity, not only to a college, but an elementary school and jobs throughout the area. Um, in addition to those, the commercial development, like we mentioned before, and actually some religious institutions located by that. So um, on April 5th, the Zoning Advisory Commission held a public hearing on the request. And at that meeting, the applicant spoke in favor of the request, stating that the affordable housing network is in the process of purchasing the property from Loris College. Um, and that purchase is contingent upon approval or rezoning. 
Um, they noted, as previously discussed, that Loris did use it for dormitory space, classroom space, and um, for housing at the location. But the property is actually going to be adapted or used by the Four Oaks program. They're looking at moving their offices to the first floor, and then the upper story units of the building are being proposed to be rehabilitated into additional residential units. Um, it's still up in the air. They're looking at between 20 to 25. I don't know exactly what the number is specifically on that, but that is something that they're looking in the future on the site. Um, and then they also noted that you know their current office has you know have 10 or fewer employees, which will actually have a lower traffic demand than what the existing facility is right now. And as I mentioned before, that building has been removed, so there is a lot of space for future expansion of, of a parking lot in order to accommodate the residents that will be located at that site. Um, staff At the meeting, staff re, uh, reviewed the staff report. We discussed the history of property and the requests that would allow the office and residential uses in the area. Uh, as, we meant it, as I mentioned before, the proposed use is not expected to increase traffic beyond the previous uses and that any building or site plans are reviewed and approved before the work takes place. And that would be primarily the parking lot expansion. Um, at the public hearing, there was a resident that lived in the area um, that stated a, a couple, uh, they had two questions and recommendations. They asked if the old pine trees are going to be taken down on the site, um, which uh, they have indicated those would not be removed. Um, but then also the retaining wall and tuck pointing on there. I mean, we are in a historic area. But one question did get brought up is the intersection there, safety and crossing at that location. Um, there is currently a crosswalk location. One block if you're on the, I guess you would say the north side, uh, two blocks if you're on the south side that takes you to a lighted uh, stoplight intersection with a crosswalk for children to attend um, uh, Fult School, or excuse me, Lincoln School off of uh, Nevada Street for that location. So um, the uh, Zoning Advisory Commission discussed the request and by a vote of seven to zero, they recommend the City Council approve the request and a simple majority vote is what's needed for you guys to also approve the request. That's all I have unless you guys have questions. Right. Thank you, Wally. Yep. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a request from the Affordable Housing Network Incorporated to rezone property located at 900 Alta Vista Street from ID Institutional District to OR Office Residential District. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? I see no one. Do we have any virtual? No one virtually. Thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. I just want to say I'm excited about this, uh, th this possibility, um, you know, in rezoning in this direction. Uh, this, this seems like an exciting idea, adding housing and residential, especially multifamily residential in this area. So I think this is a, a great addition to the neighborhood. All right. All that said, we have a motion by Roussel, second by Jones, to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. A motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number five is request to rezone 1301 Central Avenue. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting of which is to be finally passed be suspended. Second. A motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Wally, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wormont, Planning Services Manager. Um, this property is located at 31 Central Avenue and it's a pretty prominent location to City Hall, particularly across the street from us. So. Um, the subject property is composed of two buildings that have been uh, joined. One was constructed in 1870, known as the John Bell Block, and one was constructed in 1888, known as the Z-Brick Block. It has served many uses over the years, including commercial storefronts, a bank, professional offices, a public hall was located on the third floor, and there were residential apartments located in the property. But, however, most people remember the building from 1959 through 2000 as it housed the Wall Stores location. And in 2002, Heartland Financial purchased the building, renovated the, the building using historic tax credits, and used it as their operations center until they were moved into the Roshek building in 2020. Um, both of the buildings are located on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the subject property is um, comprised of one parcel, and it's approximately 1.1 acres in area. It, has, it is actually bound by four public streets located on all sides of the property. And in addition to the building, it contains 58 parking spots at the location. 
Um, the Horizon Development, which, development, which is the um, applicant for the, uh, for the proposed project, is looking at um, converting that building into 30, um, a 30 unit affordable housing project. And so the question is, so why do they have to come back, come before the Zoning Advisory Commission? So the current property is on C4 Downtown Commercial, which does not allow res or commercial pro or residential uses on the first floor, excuse me. Um, so they're looking at requesting the rezoning to OR, Office of Residential, in order to convert some of that ground floor space into residential units at that location. Um, at the meeting, uh, Scott Kwasinski, who's actually present with us tonight uh, as the applicant, uh, said the project would entail those 30 uni unit affordable housing um, units in the building. Um, they would actually be comprised of one, two, and three bedroom unit types on all three floors of the building. Uh, they did hold a public meeting. They did notify all property owners within 200 feet of the property and had discussions with those at that meeting. There was two people that attended the meeting and they were generally um, uh, inquisitive but did not oppose the request of the rezoning for the property. Um, at the Zoning Advisory Commission meeting, which was held on April 5th, the staff reviewed the staff report noting the rezoning from C4 to OR, outlining the history of the project, uh, noting that it is noted that the property is consistent with the comprehensive plan goals. Um, and those goals are to encourage a mix of housing affordable for all segments of Dubuque's population throughout the community. Um, this project proposes a mix of affordable and market rate units. Uh, integrate multifamily development within mixed use areas identified on the future land use for increased access to goods and services in a walkable environment. Multifamily development and proximity to jobs to minimize transportation costs and to create a vibrant environment where residents can live, work, and play within walking and biking distance of their home and in proximity to opportunity sites throughout the community. And elementary school, shopping, and institutions, and jobs are located in the immediate area. Um, one of the questions got brought up was recreational play space for such a location. There is um, Prescott School Playground located directly across the street, but then Jackson Park is located uh, two blocks to the north from the subject property for that location. At that public hearing, the Zoning Advisory Commission discussed the request and found that while the ground floor retail is desired in the downtown, they also understood that the proposed housing on the first floor is critical in making the project viable. And by a vote of seven to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends the City Council approve the request and a simple majority vote is needed for the City Council to concur with that rezoning request. That's all I have unless you guys have any questions. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing to consider approval of a request from Scott Kwasinski to rezone lo property located at 1301 Central Avenue from C4 Downtown Commercial to OR Office Residential to allow for residential uses on the first floor. Do we have anyone present to address us on this? Yes, please. Good evening, my name is Scott Kwasinski. I'm from Horizon Development Group, 5201 East Terrace Drive in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, thank you all for hearing this uh, request this evening. Wally did a great job summarizing. I just wanted to make myself available to help answer questions. We're excited about this property. I think it's going to be a great addition of uh, affordable housing units to the downtown. Um, our next step is to make an application with the Iowa Finance Authority. Actually, less than 48 hours from now, that'll be filed. Um, and hopefully later this year, early next, we uh, can close and start construction and build out of those units. So thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for your comments. Any others? Okay, anyone virtually? No one virtually. Thank you. Back to the table for any discussion. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Wally, not opposing the project, but will there be enough parking for that many units? Yes. And that always seems to be an issue that everybody has. Yes, so I, ironically, in a C4 downtown commercial, there are no parking requirements. So actually, in a C4 district, uh, parking is provided by the public through meters, on-street parking, parking ramps and locations. Actually, in a C4 district, if someone wanted to add a parking lot, they'd actually have to come before the city council in order to get approval to do so. Um, so what's triggering the parking requirements here is the rezoning of the property. And there are 58 um, parking spaces, I believe. I think I had that in there, 58. So with the 30 units, the off-street parking requirement is one and a half per unit, so that's 45 parking spaces. And depending on the types of units, it also depends on the number of cars. There will be a mix of one, one, two, and three bedroom location um, units in this building. 
And um, it really depends on you know what that re parking requirement is. But we also have the 10th Street parking ramp, which is located two blocks to the south. Um, there is a, a large parking lot um, that's available uh, directly across from City Hall on Iowa Street that's available for, for rent. So there are plenty of off-park um, off private off-street parking lots that are also be able to rent. But however, based on the number of units, I don't foresee them having to have that overflow under those units. It's very rare that you have a building of this size with the parking lots directly associated with it, to be honest with you. I think that's probably what it made, that's probably what made it a good candidate for proposal for redevelopment, to be honest with you, so. Uh, Ms. Roussel, Mr. Reddy. I have a, a question about um, the National Register of Historic Places. I was wondering if you could remind me how that would be addressed as changes are made. Sure, I think the applicant might be the best one to explain that. I think it might help. Um, I, I think that's part of their gap funding. Um, if you want, Mr. Kwasinski. Yeah, please. So that's a great question. Scott Krasinski, Horizon Development. Um, so we are pursuing federal and state historic credits as part of the funding platform for the project. Um, we have not made an application yet for those credits. Um, however, we're planning for that in our financial model. So that'll come later in 2023. Um, we would fully anticipate you know, complying with all the historic requirements and maintaining the facade and everything that the program does require. So um, we're really not anticipating doing anything to the outside. It's a beautiful building and the intent is to keep it that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. So uh, my concern is, uh, as mentioned, the, the play area, live, work, and play. And, um, you know, with one, two, and three bedroom units, we're going to have kids. Uh, and so it's office residential. Uh, is there some green space necessary to be uh, uh, for this uh, development? And they're really, yeah, they mentioned the areas that were mentioned to go play. Well, that, they definitely need people to get them there if they're little kids. And that's, that doesn't happen all the time. So I'd hate to have little kids, you know, hey, I don't think a parent's going to say, hey, why don't you cross those streets on your own to get to those play areas? Uh, and be totally separate from the, their supervision if they're doing, you know, work around the home or something. So could you tell me what are the possibilities uh, or you must have some possibilities for on-site play? So we, that's a great question and we've thought through this at length. Um, and actually one of the requirements with the Iowa Finance Authority is that any family or general occupancy project, residential, have uh, a playground on site. Obviously that's a lot easier to plan for if we're doing new construction on a vacant property. Here we have an existing property. So I did contact uh, Iowa Finance Authority and gain clarification on that requirement. And they actually, well, we're, we are planning to have a playground on the property that's immediately north of the building. Currently there's, uh, it's, it's the green space, there's a couple of trees, there's a pic couple of picnic tables and separating between the building and the parking lot. And our intent is to actually, our site plan actually is going to have a, a playground there. Um, following a potential award of tax credits, we would like to think through that more um, because we think that there's an alternative play situation that could even be better, which is to utilize an indoor space um, and to have some sort of a climbing area, tumbling zone, uh, some sort of a play room that we can allow that escape for kids. Um, so I couldn't agree more that we do want to have play space, especially with being a family development. Um, and we're fully intending on having that, whether that's indoor or outdoor. Right now we're showing it on the site plan as outdoor. Um, but that's to comply with the IFA requirements. We're wanting to revisit that uh, later this year, hopefully once we get into tax credit award. Um, the other thing that's really attractive is that 400, 450 feet away is Jackson Park, and it's a beautiful park. And honestly, that's one of the benefits of living downtown is being able to walk a block and get to a wonderful recreation space. So those are our thoughts. We've actually contemplated this at a pretty high level um, in the past week or two. Great, thanks. You mentioned the word escape. So. You know, uh, it's just uh, if the area is going to be on site, like uh, I'm hoping, 
that are there going to be fences around it and, and protections uh, for those kids? Absolutely. Anything outdoor is going to have to be protected. Great. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. This, this is just a bullseye project. Um, everything that's good about cities, this makes better about this city. Um, a high priority of us has to be to continue to develop housing downtown. It's good for downtown. It's good for the people that live in there. It's good for traffic. It's good for the east-west congestion. If you don't have to get in your car to get to your groceries and, and, uh, and to, to do your living and go to work, it's, uh, it's just win, win, win. And the fact that uh, this is going to cater to some low-income folks that need a, a leg up to get started in life, um, how could you possibly vote against it? Can't wait. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. As the councilwoman that represents Ward 4, I just want to say thank you. Um, these sort of developments are what I could only picture for the families in my community. Um, to have something so close to a park, so close to a school, it's our responsibility to make sure that space is safe for crossing and pedestrian walks. Um, we're working you know, to make this a walkable community, and this is a great step, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I, I said I was excited about the last one, but I'm really excited about this one too. You know, this is just such a perfect place for, for downtown um, housing development right there. It was a great home for, um, for Heartland and, and DB&T staff for a long time, uh, for an even longer time for the Walsh stores. I didn't realize it was 1959, you said, all the way to 2000. That's a long time. Um, but it's, uh, it, it really is just such a perfect spot with so many great amenities right there. Um, I, I did receive one phone call from a resident who said they were um, adamantly against this idea that we um, essentially we don't need any more, um, in, in his words, low income housing downtown. Um, very respectfully, I couldn't disagree more. I think we've had multiple discussions at this table uh, about how we need more housing like this for all Income levels. We've talked about all income levels. We need housing in general. And the fact that, um, Scott, people like you continue to step up, thank you. And especially for Horizon. I, I'm glad you're here tonight to be able to tell you this to your face. Um, you've done such great development here in Dubuque, and, and we are so glad to continue to have you as a partner. Uh, we look forward to a long partnership to come, hopefully, but this is another great way to, to jump in. Um, your development has not been all the same. It's really kind of been in different parts of town for different folks, and we really appreciate the fact that you continue to step up to do that. So thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to voting for this and uh, hopefully being able to um, see this project move forward in the future. Well, with all that said, um, we have a motion by Jones, second by Roussel, to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number six is proceedings for the public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $6,250,000 taxable general obligation bond series 2023A. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. <laughs> I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson recommends City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for the public hearing and the issuance of selling not to exceed $6,250,000 in taxable general obligation bonds. $5,676,000 of the proceeds is intended for projects in the city budget previously approved by the city council, which include old engine house, second floor build out, fire headquarters, HVAC replacement, Dubuque Ice Center settling remediation, five flags renovation design, new downtown parking ramp property acquisition related cost, and parking ramp major maintenance repairs. $574,000 is intended to provide funds for bond issuance costs and contingency for fluctuations in the bond market for interest rates, bond issuance costs, capitalized interest, and change in project cost. Although the city is selling general obligation bonds to support the projects, repayment of the debt will be local option sales tax and greater downtown tax increment financing. As to the non-urban renewal essential corporate purpose portion of the issue, 
The proceedings are prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the City Council to issue the bonds. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the City Council decides not to abandon the proposal to issue bonds, a form of resolution follows that should be introduced and adopted, entitled, Resolution taking additional action on proposals to enter into loan agreements and combining loan agreements. As to the general corporate purpose and urban renewal essential corporate purpose portions of the issue, the proceedings have been prepared on the basis that no petition will be filed asking that the question of issuing the bonds be submitted to the qualified electors of the city. The proceedings refer to the fact that the hearing was held and that no petition had been filed. The mayor will then declare the hearing on the issuance of the bonds to be closed. Immediately following each hearing, a resolution is to be introduced and adopted, taking additional action for the issuance. If a valid petition is filed, however, bond council should be notified as soon as possible and the proceedings will need to be revised to cover the action taken by the city council in either abandoning the proposal to issue the bonds or directing the county commissioner to call a special election upon the question of issuing the bonds. The Code of Iowa provides that any resident or property owner of the city may appeal the decision to take additional action to issue the bonds to the district court of a county in which any part of the city is located within 15 days after such additional action is taken. But the additional action is final and inclusive unless the court finds that the city council exceeded its authority. In the event an appeal is filed by any resident or property owner, bond council must be notified as soon as possible. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider city council approval of suggested proceedings for the public hearing on the issuance of selling not to exceed $6,250,000 in taxable general obligation bonds. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No one virtually. Thank you. Back to the table then for discussion. Okay. Seeing none, the motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number seven is public hearing for sale of city-owned property at 2407 Queen Street. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. A motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. And a motion by Sprank and a second by Resnick. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council hold a public hearing and approve the purchase agreement for 2407 Queen Street to Melissa Sarazen for the submitted offer of $145,000. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider city council hold a public hearing and approve the purchase agreement for 2407 Queen Street to Melissa Sarazin for the submitted offer of $145,000. Is there anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, anyone virtually? No one virtually. Thank you. Back to the table then for discussion. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Sprite. I know we'll probably approve this, but I just want to welcome a new neighbor to my neighborhood. So welcome, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sprite. All right. Okay. Motion is to receive and file. Adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the Mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then City staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. All right, thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public input this evening? 
I see no one coming up. Any virtual input? No virtual input. Okay. Last call. Okay, moving on then. We can go to action items. Action item number one is resolution of support for proposed low income housing project horizon development. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Farber, second by Wethel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approval of a resolution of support for a proposed 30 unit low income housing project by Horizon Development at 1301 Central Avenue. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Seeing none. Okay. Motion is to receive and file. Adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number two is resolution of support for proposed low income housing project, grown in development. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Motion by Resnick and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approval of a resolution of support for a proposed rehabilitation of low-income housing at the Henry Stout Apartments, 125 West 9th Street by Gronin Development. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Another bullseye. Yeah. Other than to say it's exciting to see so much development on one agenda. This is great. This is really wonderful. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. Again, as um, moving more housing into Ward 4, I just couldn't be happier about tonight's additions to um, my community. So thanks to all involved. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, the motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number three is 2022 Most Dynamic Metros publication. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file. Second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Mike, did you... Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor. Uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, I don't really have any prepared remarks, but I would just point out that the significance of uh, this uh, ranking is that when you compare where Dubuque ranked last year in 2021, uh, we were 294th on the list, and in 2022, we were 154th on the list. So we improved 140 slots, which of all the hundreds of communities they analyzed, that was the fifth best improvement from number of slots to, to drop down. And, and since they do hundreds of communities, uh, to be at the 154 spot is a, is a very envious position to be in. And um, you, know, you can read the report yourself, it's very thorough, um, but I would suggest it's a testament to the partnerships the mayor and city council has done with private developers across the community and the decisions you've made to continue to make this a better place to live. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate those comments. Any others? It's nice to know that, uh, I mean, kind of as uh, Jennifer said earlier tonight when she was receiving a, her award, you know, I'm, we do the work because the work needs to be done and, and we're glad to do it. Um, but it is nice to know as a community that people are taking notice when we're doing some of these things. And I think it's important that we, we move this forward. So thank you. All right, motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number four is leisure services, temporary employee recruitment and hiring update. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, oh. Ms. Farber. <laughs> I move we receive and file. Second. And a motion by Farber, second by Sprank. Uh, Mike, please. Um, thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. So Leisure Services Manager Murray Ware, who is here to answer any questions, if you have any, there's no formal presentation, um, has submitted the recruitment of the hiring for temporary staff for this summer. And as you'll certainly remember just recently there was a media release 
and a newspaper article to say that uh, Marie and Shelley Stickford, our human resources director, and Randy Gale, um, our public information officer, have been successful in creating enough information out there uh, that we will be able to open both of the pools this summer. And while we still have some hiring to do, as you can see from the report, that there's a lot of good progress being made. But Marie Ware is here to answer any questions directly if you have any of hers to her. All right. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Sprank. Marie, when can we buy pool passes? <laughs> <laughs> You actually made her stand up to answer that I question. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, you that's could have okay. shouted. No, that's <laughs> fine. Um, actually, that's one of those where I leave that to the rest of my staff. So uh, in the media release, I'm pretty sure it said um, what that information. Dan said he was going to be on virtually. So if he is, if he can be unmuted. Uh, yeah, this is Dan Kroger, Recreation Division Manager. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Sure can. Oh, fantastic. Sorry, I couldn't be there tonight. But um, uh, April 28th is when registration starts for all summer programs as well as uh, pool passes. Thank you. 9 a.m. So I'll see you up front. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Marie, Dan, great job. This is fantastic. It's, it's just so exciting to see numbers like this with the challenges that we've had the last few years. And I know that you've felt those challenges more than anybody. So thank you very much for all the work that you're doing and everybody who's involved. We know Randy's involved and, quite a, and Shelley and quite a few people. So um, this is great work. This is really great. Looking really good. Okay, motion is to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number five is work session request, achieve it, and imagine Dubuque. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and schedule the achieve it and imagine work session for Monday, June 5th at 530. Second by Wethel. And motion by Resnick, second by Wethel. Working for everybody. Excellent. All right. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is delivering Dubuque trash tipper carts video. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? I move to receive and file and view the video. Second. And a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Eric, you can roll the footage, please. While setting out the trash and recycling is a quick weekly task for most of us, it's an everyday focus for the City of Dubuque's Public Works curbside collection crews. The containers we toss our recycling and trash into are critical to this service and to the crews that make over 4,000 stops a day. In this episode of Delivering Dubuque, we discuss how the City of Dubuque is rolling out the use of standardized tipper carts to improve the trash collection process for customers and city staff. So in last year's budget, the Dubuque City Council moved forward with a recommendation from our city staff to issue tipper carts to all of the city's solid waste customers. So here to talk to us about that transition today is Resource Management Supervisor Jake Jansen. Jake, thanks a lot for being here today. Thank you for being here, Mayor. It's a really important topic to talk about and I'm excited to tell you more about it. All right, excellent. So actually on that note, why don't you just give us like the general scope of what this really is? Like why are we moving forward with this project and what is it? The main goal of moving to an automated collection system is to improve our safety and efficiency of the service we're providing. So right now we're getting tipper cards to all city curbside collection customers who currently don't have one already. Yeah. So you talk about safety, and you know, that's one of the big points that we talked about a lot as we passed this last year as a city council. You know, talk a little bit about the process that people have to go through to be able to collect all the solid waste that we have in the community. Honestly, safety is the number one reason why we're making this transition. We want to do everything we can to protect our workers. And getting out of the truck at every stop hundreds of times a day, that takes a toll. And 
Unfortunately, and we've seen an increase of injuries, and we want to make sure that we can reduce that, and embracing automation is the best thing we can do to keep our workers safe. And another really important aspect is the safety of our community too. Lugging trash or whatever the material is to the curb, it can be laborious, and we want that experience to be improved. We want to make sure we give every single customer a quality cart to do that. So safety is one benefit that you mentioned, but talk about some other benefits of this. Efficiency is a big one. Here at Public Works, we're proud of the services we provide. Whether it be snowing, raining, whatever the elements are, we want to make sure we provide that service. And the good news is, is Dubuque's only growing, and to meet that demand, we got to embrace technology like automation. And automation will allow us to do that. Depends on the area, but we should be around 30 to 40 percent more efficient to collect trash or water recycling through the automated system. But another really important piece is a clean city. You know, how the system has worked in the past is we expect our customers to bring the trash in their own personal can or just even placing it at the curb. And you know, when it's not contained in a cart, it's really at risk for loose litter in our neighborhoods. And we want clean neighborhoods, we all do. And so if we can keep those materials contained in a cart, we'll likely see a cleaner community. So these carts aren't new. I mean, the carts that are sitting behind us here, I actually have one of these that I got last year, but the difference now is that everybody's going to get one, right? So can you talk a little bit more about that process and what that's gonna look like? So everyone will have their own city issue tipper cart. It's a transition, it's not gonna happen overnight, and the reality is, is we've had carts in the community for over 10 years now. Of our about 20,000 customers we serve every week, maybe a little bit over 40% right now, has a city issue tip for cart. In April, we're gonna start delivering on a mass deployment basis of our basic cart, which is 35 gallons. So any customer that's paying the basic rate um, will receive a 35 gallon cart unless they let us know they need a larger cart. We offer four different sizes, a 48 gallon, a 64, and a 96, and then of course our 35 gallon cart. And for folks that need a bigger cart, they just need to let us know but we're willing to work with everybody and really meet the needs of the customer. So over time, people are gonna be start to see these carts showing up. Not everybody's gonna get them all at the same time, but it's gonna be a process. And over yeah. a matter of months and throughout this next year, we're gonna be moving towards everybody having a cart. Yeah, it's a phased in approach. You know, there's a lot of different factors in place there. Whether we're gonna deal with different staffing issues and just, it's gonna be every hands on deck to make it happen. We're going to make sure that every single customer in the Buke area is going to get their city issue tipper cart. Excellent. So I think it's important to point out as we talk about this that we're not fully automated yet. Not all the trucks have the automated collection arm. So as we look forward to automating more fully, what is that going to look like? Over time, we're going to get more trucks that have the automated collection arm. But the reality is, is Dubuque's unique. We are a hilly town, we have tight alleys, and there just might be some areas that we can't fully automate. But the more that we can automate, the safer we're gonna be and reduce the amount of time that our drivers have to get out of the truck. The good news is that once we get everybody into a city-issued tipper cart, we still can collect the materials at a semi-automatic process, which is a lot better than having our drivers manually collect the trash at stop after stop. This allows technology to lighten the load. Sure, yeah. Do you wanna see what that looks like? I would love to see what that looks like. It's really cool, let's yeah. check it out. All right, let's go. So this is one of our fully automated collection vehicles. It has an automated collection arm, and to show us how it works is our lead sanitation driver, Tony Severson. How are we doing today? Hey, Tony, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Let's start this thing up, and I'll show you a demonstration. All right. So the nice thing about this new truck, when you roll up to a stop, you don't even have to get out. You got this nice joystick here. Line up your cart, pull your arm out, Close it up, pull it back in a little, up it goes. Back down. Go out with it, right back to the spot you picked it up. And that's all there is to it, and on to the next stop. Let's go look at the other truck. All right, cool. So that was the fully automated truck. Now this next one is the semi-automated, right? So for places that we can't fully automate. Right, correct. So we have the tipper cart actually on the side of the truck where the driver would have to get out, move the cart over to the truck, hook that up, 
And then you can go from there with this hydraulic arm. We've been talking a lot about the tipper carts and the ways we do this from an automated standpoint, semi-automated. This is an older trash can that we've used before. And you know, I'd like to know a little bit about what it looks like for somebody to do this day in and day out, time and time again. Sure, sure. So you're talking from the cab of the truck out to your stop. Several hundred times a day, the crew has to get out like this. Undo that, come up and over the shoulder, you're dumping, 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 and back to the curb. Or if we come to the cart, we can grab our cart, use the wheels to our advantage, and the crew can just roll it right up to the truck. Huge difference. So one of the things that I know is really important, and, and this I think about this as a customer, right? So I'm a customer, so I know that there's some rules I need to follow to make sure that it's put in a place where it's safe and effective for you guys to do your job. So what do we need to think about? We need the arrows facing the street. We need a clear area. And we also need so the lid is not overflowing with bags and the lid is tight down. And you know, if you frequently are putting a lot of bags and they don't fit in your cart, or you have larger carts, you just gotta let us know, call us or fill out a form on our, on our website. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, this has been super helpful. Thank you so much for being here and telling us more about this. I know this is gonna be a big transition for everybody, but I know that with all this information, we're gonna be able to make it work pretty well. There's one more thing I want to see though. I want to see how this works because this is a semi-automated one. So maybe we can fire this up and see. All right, let's do it. So I wanna, I wanna thank Jake and Tony for helping with that video. You know, we know how long this discussion was for us as we made this decision, but the, um, the amount of information that they're putting out to help residents make this change is, is really pretty impressive. I mean, between the public information office, this video, multiple other videos and publications that are going out. So I really appreciate the work that everybody's doing to make this easier. I think it's helping. Um, I, I am getting some calls here and there, but not um, so many that, that people seem like they're generally very confused. I think really it's, you know, some very pointed questions that residents have, but otherwise I think they're doing a great job getting the word out. So, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, quick questions. And you mentioned already that we have re um, received some responses about, you know, um, it doesn't work best for them necessarily, and they need to be talked through a certain solution. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, do they know who to call and who to talk to? When they, they talk to us, and I mean, I think that they get um, uh, some kind of communication from the city manager and, and city staff as well, because uh, this is, uh, like you say, brand new, and there will be challenges for people um, considering their situation. It was uh, alluded to that Dubuque is a, a winding and steep place, and, and there, there are some tricky situations that could use some individual attention. Um, that's my first question is, are they receiving that attention? Which I think they are. And then when do we plan to get an update since we're just breaking this out? Is there every three months or are they going to come and say, here's what's, here's what's going on so far and uh, here's what uh, the challenges have been and here's how we've addressed those. Thank you. Mike, do you sure. want to address the um, question? City sure. Manager Mike Van Milligan. So July 1st is the kickoff date. So people are getting them delivered now, um, but they're not required to use them until July 1st. And so we can give you an update soon after that. Um, we have gotten questions and comments and we are uh, trying to work through those issues with individual people. And um, I think that staff has some good ideas on how to do that. And so we'll, we'll give you some updates. Thank you. I know it's not on the agenda. I just remember uh, getting my cart from the city and being impressed with how sturdy it was and how it was much better than the things that I was buying out at certain stores, right? So I'm just wondering, uh, um, do the stores know that we're doing this? And, uh, and I don't know if there could be some notice that says that the city of Dubuque will be required to have city uh, uh, canisters or not. So uh, I don't know if there's communication with the stores to let our, our citizens know that they really shouldn't spend 40 bucks on a, a new trash can if they're going to be using these. 
Yeah, I can check on that. I actually think we did notifications of the stores last year to, when, or when it got approved. Okay. So but I'll check on the store notifications. Sure. And I appreciate you um, giving me a little bending on this. It's not on the agenda, but uh, since we talked about those, um, that issue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Well, the motion was to receive and file. Watch that video. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprang. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Next are council member reports. I know Ms. Roussel has one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, I'm sorry that you couldn't be there, but last Friday I got to be Mayor Pro Tem at the International Rural Churches Association. And the bishop from India gave me, presented me with this lovely shawl. And it is so beautiful that I would like to share it with the whole community by donating it to the Multicultural Family Center to have it either on display or be used at their celebrations or for lots of people to be able to enjoy it. So thank you. Sweet. Thank you. And thank you for being there. I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor, we, uh, we celebrated a little bit the uh, ability to open both pools and, and we named a lot of people that were involved with that from inside organization. And I'm, I'm sorry he left, but John wrote about it every time we talked about it. And it was uh, prominent in the Telegraph Hill, and we got to thank our media partners for helping us get that word out, because I think that brought us a lot of prospective employees in the door. Yeah, thank you for saying that, yeah. We'll have to make sure we all let John know when he calls us in the next couple of days, because <laughs> we do appreciate his calls. Any others? Well, I, I want to thank um, Council Members Jones and Roussel for inviting me to the Kiwanis International uh, Luncheon today to have some uh, just a general discussion about city politics. I, I really appreciated the opportunity to do that. It was an honor to sit with everybody and, and talk, and thank you very much. I, I told them we were dangerously near a quorum, but we did just fine. We didn't discuss any matters of public importance, so it was great. But it was a, it was a really good discussion. I, I always appreciate being able to talk to, um, for all of us, I mean, we get these opportunities to talk to really involved and um, invested uh, residents of the community. So thanks again for doing that. All right. Well, we do have a closed session, so I would entertain a motion, please. Sure. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move the City Council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending real estate sales. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. For the record, the attorney of the City Council will consult on the issues to be discussed at the closed session is City Attorney Corona Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Bresnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.